Life is a story about risks, the ones that we actually calculate and weigh out, and the other ones that we just accept as part of a life well lived. We could die playing table games, skiing, running, jogging, dance party, which in my mind is probably the best way to go. <laughs> um, it could be as simple as jumping on your bike or getting in a car. Averaged across the population, we have a 1 in 112 chance of dying in a motor vehicle incident. Yet most of us accept those odds for the convenience of traveling from point A to point B. And while this is a story about risk, it's not about dying, it's about living. See, for me, the choice was easy. I view the vaccine the same way I view a car seat. In the event of one of those motor vehicle incidents, my child is safer in a car seat. In the event of a measles outbreak, he's probably safer if he's been vaccinated. <laughs> and he has. <laughs> this is my son at his two-month checkup just after he got his the vaccines. And yes, I'm that weird parent that takes pictures of their kids after they get vaccinated. On the right, his immunization record, which as of two weeks ago, it is 15-month checkup. He is up to date, not delayed, no exemptions. But this is bolder, and I realize that the choice for many of you isn't as easy as it was for me. If by chance you turn to the internet or the GOP debate, then you know <laughs> just how confusing these messages might be. And the reality is, we're parents, we're just trying to make the best decision for our children. But how did we get here? Now, vaccination has a really long history. But if we just dial it back 60 years ago to an auditorium like this one, Dr. Francis revealed the results of the Salk polio vaccine trial. It was one of the largest medical experiments in history, consisting of 1.8 million children. Safe, effective, and potent. Immediately thereafter, the March of Dimes launched a national ad campaign, and some of the most notable celebrities of that era showed up to be the face of vaccination. Fast forward a few decades, we have a slightly different situation. <laughs> On the top is Andrew Wakefield, whose fraudulent paper trying to link the MMR vaccine to an autism-like disorder has since been retracted. He was a fraud. The whole story was fabricated, and he was part of a host of an, an amazing number of ethical issues. Since then, over 100 studies have definitively shown that there is no link between autism and vaccines. Yet celebrities like Jenny McCarthy and Jim Carrey continue to push this dangerous agenda. It usually starts with a story, and then another story about a friend or a neighbor. But let me remind you that the plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> And perhaps more troubling than that is that a lot of the resources that are designed to incite fear about vaccinations cherry-pick data sets out of context to tell a story that isn't even there. So I present this joke slide from Redditor Jason P55, which <laughs> it turns out if you cherry-pick the rise in organic food sales over time and you lay that on a chart with the rise in autism spectrum disorder diagnoses, it looks pretty compelling. <laughs> but I think we can all agree that more than likely, the root cause of autism isn't organic food. This is bolder. So what's the risk? The problem is that we're sitting in a hot, dry forest on a windy day just waiting for a match. Because Colorado kindergartners have the lowest measles vaccination rate in the entire country. And we live in a global community. People from all over the world travel into and out of Boulder all the time. This map shows countries highlighted in red that have experienced measles outbreaks in the first six months of 2015. Many of those countries are pretty popular destinations. But maybe you're like me or a lot of people in this room, and you've never even seen measles. And the reason for that is that vaccination is a victim of its own success. You see, we've done such a good job of vaccinating in this country over the past few decades that we don't know what those diseases look like anymore. 
and it becomes an out of sight, out of mind situation. But now the vaccination rates are starting to drop and the tides are turning. This is what measles looks like. It's the only medical image in the whole talk, but I thought it was important enough to just pause and reflect for a minute on what a sick child looks like, a child with measles. But let me draw the picture of what measles looks like. Because for the first four days, somebody just presents with cold-like symptoms. Runny nose, fever, cough, sore throat. They're contagious. After about four days, the rash sets in. And for another four days, that person is still highly contagious. It's one of the most contagious viral diseases known. On the top, we see the number of people that one infected person would likely infect in the susceptible population. On the left, you see Ebola, where one infected person is only likely to infect two other people on average in that susceptible population. On the far right, measles, 18. One person with measles may infect up to 18 people in that susceptible population. And the reason that it's so contagious is that it's an airborne disease. It can actually persist in the airspace for up to two hours after an infected person has coughed or sneezed. So you can imagine, with your tongue planted firmly in your cheek, why someone might say, our thoughts are also with the measles-ravaged country, America. I hope we are screening them before they come to Africa. But as I said, this is a story about risk. So let's actually compare the risks of the disease versus the vaccine. Let's take this front row right here, 20 people. Let's give them measles, sorry. Uh, with that, we would expect two people to have ear infection, two people to have diarrhea, uh, and one person to have pneumonia, which I might add is one of the deadliest complications of measles. Now, if we swap that out for 20 people with the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, we'd expect to have just over three people with a fever and one with a mild rash. Getting back to the disease, if we scale that population out to 1,000 people, we'd expect to also find one person with encephalitis, or swelling of the brain tissues, which can have severe permanent damage, and one to two people would die. However, we have to scale the population out to one million vaccinations to see one severe reaction. Now, perhaps you're willing to roll the dice, perhaps you're willing to take that chance. And the problem is, while this is a personal decision, it affects other people. Vaccinations work based on herd immunity. When the population is not vaccinated, disease spreads rapidly through a community. When only part of a community is vaccinated, that disease still spreads very easily. However, when most of a population is vaccinated, we can contain that disease. In the case of measles, that number is 95%. 95% of the population would need to be vaccinated to contain measles. So let's see how we stack up. Remember that hot, dry forest I mentioned? This is a sample of a few schools in Boulder Valley School District that have some of the lowest vaccination rates in the community. And you can see this red line represents that 95%. These are some pretty serious gaps. We should be trying to close this gap on vaccination because that 95% is what keeps us all safe. Now imagine a student shows up at Gold Hill Elementary with cold-like symptoms. Four days later when that rash shows up, a large percentage of that student body has measles. Because in a susceptible population where people aren't vaccinated, estimated about 90% of them will get measles. But maybe it's not the disease or the complications that bother you. Maybe that's not what keeps you from getting vaccinated. So let's just pick on two of the most hated ingredients in a vaccine for the sake of time, aluminum and thimerosal. Aluminum is in the vaccine in the form of aluminum salts. They're used as an adjuvant, which is just a fancy word for something in the vaccine that makes your immune system respond even more efficiently. 
Here's the thing about aluminum, though. It's the third most abundant element on Earth. It's all around you. It's in the air you breathe. It's in the food you eat. And it turns out we're actually pretty good at getting rid of it. So let's look at aluminum in the first six months and compare the amount in vaccines to what you might find in breast milk or formula. Now, this amount is milligrams. These are small. A milligram or a thousandth of a gram. And for reference, a gram is roughly a fifth of a teaspoon of water. Small doses. And this shouldn't raise the alarm on soy formula, because it turns out that the amount in six months of soy formula is the same as about roughly one antacid, similar to the one I took before this talk. Now, thimerosal is a slightly different story. It is a mercury-containing compound. It was found to do an excellent job of being a preservative for vaccines to protect them from contamination. The thing about thimerosal is there isn't actually a lot of evidence that shows any harm in the doses in vaccines from this compound. Yet even despite that lack of evidence, as of the year 2000, most vaccines don't use thimerosal. So I bring up this chart. These are the immunizations my son has received at Boulder Community Hospital in the first 15 months of his life. You can see that all but one never contained thimerosal. And the one that did stopped using it in 1999. So just maybe the risks of vaccines aren't so bad. And we're in this together. Because vaccination is about community, and this is our herd. The system works really well, but it is incredibly fragile. When we dip below those herd immunity thresholds, the system begins to fail. Now, when you think of that 95% for measles, that 5% left over isn't for otherwise healthy people to dip into. It's for our friends and family that don't have the luxury of being vaccinated. Some newborn babies, young children, elderly, people with certain severe allergic reactions, people who are immune compromised, they're part of our herd, and they depend on us to protect them. So please, help us close that vaccination gap and support your herd. Thank you.